So let's get into it. Let's start the scientific program of the conference. So it is my pleasure to introduce Stuart Russell, um, known for his many, many contributions to artificial intelligence. Who has not used his textbook on artificial intelligence? Around 1,300 universities in 116 countries use this book. Stuart was born in Portsmouth, England, received his Bachelor of Arts degree in first class honours in physics from Vatham College in Oxford in 1982, and his PhD in computer science from Stanford University in 1986 for research on inductive reasoning and analogical reasoning. After his PhD, he joined the faculty of the University of California at Berkeley, where since 1996 he is professor of computer science. He also holds an appointment as adjunct professor of neurological surgery at the University of California, San Francisco, where he pursues research in computational physiology and intensive care unit monitoring. In 2016, he co-founded the Center for Human Compatible Artificial Intelligence at UC Berkeley and is on the Scientific Advisory Board for the Future of Life Institute and the Advisory Board of the Center for the Study of Existential Risk. His work has been internationally recognized with many awards and honors, among them the Ichikai Computers and Thought Award, which I uh, awarded a few minutes back in 1995, and the ACM Carl V. Karlstrom Outstanding Educator Award in 2005. He was appointed to the Blaise Pascal Chair in Paris in 2012 and is also a fellow of ACM and AAAI. Without further ado, please join me welcoming Stuart Russell. Okay, thank you very much, Carlos. Uh, it's wonderful to be here in Melbourne. And uh, let me begin by uh, talking a little bit about some of the progress that's happened in artificial intelligence. If I can figure out how to get the slides to move. Hmm. Try this one. Okay, good. All right. Um, so this is Lee Sedol, uh, one of the world's greatest Go players, and he's having what we uh, sometimes call a holy cow moment, uh, where he's realizing that, uh, in fact, AI has progressed a lot faster than we expected. It wasn't that long ago that the New York Times predicted it would be 100 years before a computer beat the world champion. Uh, and it turned out to be just a couple of years. Uh, here's our robot, uh, whose name is Brett, uh, at Berkeley. And if I can figure out how to get the video to play, uh, we should see Brett doing the laundry. Um, so this is quite an impressive piece of work from my colleague, Peter Abiel. And just to show you the rate at which AI is progressing, uh, Brett is soon to be a museum piece. So the Victoria and Albert Museum in London uh, is going to have an exhibition uh, next year, and Brett will be the centerpiece of that expedition, uh, exhibition. Uh, people hopefully will be able to bring laundry, and Brett will fold it for them. Uh, here's a graph that many of you have seen. This is the rate of progress on the ImageNet competition. Uh, and you can see that uh, with the advent of deep learning in 2012, the error rate uh, started to plummet uh, to the point now where uh, it's relatively straightforward for an undergraduate to beat uh, the vision performance of a human being on this task, even a human being who spent several weeks training on this particular data set uh, and this particular challenge. So that's very impressive. Um, we could look at uh, an even more impressive task, actually writing captions, not just recognizing objects, but writing captions. Here is a group of people shopping at an outdoor market. There are many vegetables at the fruit stand. So a very impressive uh, task that, uh, you know, 10 years ago, we would have been uh, utterly shocked uh, if that was possible. Now, it doesn't always work, and I'd like to um, commend the authors of this particular paper on 
uh, being very honest about the performance limitations of their system, uh, unlike uh, many vision papers, they actually give examples of where it fails. So here's a, uh, here's a street sign, which apparently is a refrigerator filled with lots of food and drinks. Um, now, when you see that, you wonder, OK, perhaps the performance on the previous example wasn't quite as uh, impressive, uh, that maybe there was some fluke involved. Or, or something. So you go back and look at that picture, and the group of people, well, there is no group of people. Um, they're shopping. Well, nobody is shopping, actually, in the picture. Uh, and there is no fruit stand. Um, so I think we need, um, as Ramon said, we need to be a little careful before we announce success uh, in the field of AI, that uh, from now on it's just a matter of bigger data sets and, and more CPUs uh, and, uh, and we'll be reaching human level AI. I actually believe we are still a long way from that. Um, and I would like to say, in disagreement with Ramon, that those who, uh, for example, like Nick Bostrom, who are predicting uh, possibly negative consequences from superintelligent AI, are actually more uh, pessimistic about the rate of progress. They put uh, the achievement of human level AI further into the future than the average AI researcher does. Um, so I don't think that the, the doomsayers, as they're called, uh, are saying that doom is right around the corner, um, but nonetheless saying that we need to prepare for it eventually, and that's what some of my talk is about. Um, so is, uh, uh, is deep learning just going to grow and grow and grow uh, until it consumes the entire field? Um, I don't think so. We can ask the deep learning people, uh, Francois Cholet is a very respected uh, deep learning researcher, author of one of the major Python-based deep learning packages and, and a, a very impressive textbook. And he writes, uh, many more applications are completely out of reach for current deep learning techniques, even given vast amounts of human annotated data. Um, and I think this is a very important point. Just as in the 1960s, uh, when we were able to solve you know, three or four step planning problems, we assumed that it was just a matter of time and we'd, we'd be able to solve all planning problems. And we forgot about exponential computational complexity. Uh, and I think we're in danger now of making the same mistake with data. We are forgetting that uh, limited techniques, knowledge-free learning methods may, for some tasks, require exponential amounts of data uh, that could neither possibly be learned or, or in fact, could not possibly exist. Uh, he goes on to say, uh, the, the main directions in which I see promise are models closer to general purpose computer programs uh, as opposed to feed forward circuits. Um, and I agree, and in fact, uh, there's already a field that does exactly that called parabolistic programming. Uh, so parabolistic programs are formal models uh, in, in a language that has Turing equivalent expressive power, which means that any, uh, any language for writing any probability model uh, is effectively equivalent to or subsumed by uh, one of these probabilistic programming languages. Uh, and they have the property, like Bayesnets, that every well-formed probabilistic program uh, denotes a unique distribution over an arbitrarily complex set of worlds with, with possibly different numbers of objects, different relations among ob objects, different causal structures, uh, different uh, evolutionary histories over time, and so on. So you can represent uh, uh, extremely complex theories in these languages and bring to bear on any learning problem a great deal of prior knowledge. And they come along with general purpose inference algorithms so that in principle, subject to the usual caveats uh, about convergence and, and computational complexity, because of course all these things are really undecidable, uh, but the general purpose algorithms will find the answer to any query with respect to any model and any data set. Um, and when I give talks about the probabilistic programming research in my group, I often, you know, I'll show the probabilistic program, and I'll show you a couple in a minute. Um, and then I talk about how the algorithm works, and I, and I give some results. And I think what I should do is pretend that these are really deep learning systems, um, because then the audience would like them much more. Uh, and in fact, in some sense, they are. They, they are automatically, dynamically generating uh, deep generative networks of unbounded width and depth and variable structure during the inference process. Um, and in fact, the one I'm going to show you for seismic monitoring uh, can generate between 100,000 and 500,000 random variables uh, in a fairly deeply connected and very complex uh, network. So let me talk about that uh, seismic monitoring application. 
this is a small nuclear test that was carried out uh, in Nevada, or this is the aftermath of a small nuclear test that was carried out in Nevada. Uh, and in the 50s and 60s, in fact, uh, this used to be a big tourist destination. So people would get on tour buses and drive out and see uh, nuclear tests. They would watch them with glasses, or they would uh, go and look at the crater afterwards. Um, so it was a different time. Uh, the largest nuclear test was uh, actually 500 times bigger than this one. And um, to put an end to testing, uh, in the hope that we would put an end to the nuclear arms race, uh, a comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty was proposed originally in 1958. Uh, it was finally opened for signature in 1996. And um, the, the treaty comes with a verification arm uh, called the International Monitoring System, which consists of a very large number of monitoring stations around the world, several hundred of these, uh, a large satellite network. Uh, in all, it cost over a billion dollars, and there's a, a data processing center in Vienna where all this data is collected and processed in real time uh, in order to detect uh, seismic events and classify ones which might potentially be nuclear explosions. So the evidence, if we formulate this as Bayesian inference, the evidence uh, is the waveforms collected from all these seismic stations, which look like, you know, as you know, seismic wiggles. Um, and so there are hundreds of these terabytes of data every year. The query is what happened? So what were all the seismic events that took place in the last 24 hours? Where did they take place? How big were they? How deep were they? Um, and so here's a little map of seismic events over a three-month period, and you can see that most of the stuff happens in Southeast Asia. And then the model is what we know about geophysics. So we have an idea about the geographical distribution of natural seismic events. Uh, we have knowledge of the physics of signal propagation. We have information about the level of seismic noise uh, in the background of each of the detectors. Uh, and we know about how fast signals travel through the Earth and the paths that they take. So all of that geophysics and knowledge, uh, including the uncertainties involved in those models, are expressed in this program, which is written in a probabilistic programming language called Blog. Um, and this is the entire program. It took about half an hour to write. Uh, once we understood, you know, we went to uh, some sessions in Vienna where they explained to us uh, the nature of the problem and the, the underlying physics. And it was very straightforward to write this. Uh, it took a little longer to get it to run fast enough to handle all the data uh, on a global scale in real time. Uh, but that's exactly what it does. It runs uh, an MCMC algorithm in real time, doing Bayesian inference with respect to all the seismic data collected from the world uh, and with respect to this um, probabilistic model. And to show you the performance, this is the original uh, United Nations automated system, which is the result of about 100 years of seismology research, uh, and as I said, about a billion dollars of investment. And this is the failure rate of the system. So this is the fraction of events that the system fails to detect that then subsequently the human experts have to go back into the data and trawl through it, uh, find all the unexplained blips, and then see if they can reconstruct the events that produce those blips uh, in the data. So it's between 30 and 50% error rate. Um, and the NetVisa system, which is the model that I just showed you, has uh, an error rate between 10 and 14%. So a very substantial reduction in the error rate. Um, and as a result, the United Nations in 2014 announced that NetVisa uh, will become the official monitoring system for the treaty. Uh, and here's a little example. Uh, this is North Korea. This is a test that took place in February 2013. Uh, in fact, it took place the morning that I was giving a talk uh, in Padua. Uh, and so I actually had to update the slides to add one to the count of nuclear tests that had taken place. Uh, and then my, my former student, Nima Aurora, who actually did all the work, uh, sent me this uh, picture. And so it shows the region in North Korea uh, where the test was suspected to take place. And the, the top left, the green triangle, is the, the location that was the consensus location uh, of the combined uh, geophysicists of the world analyzing all the data. Uh, and this is where they announced the test to have taken place. Uh, this is the NetVisa location. Um, and then the, the black cross is subsequently uh, by satellite imaging uh, they found the entrance to the tunnel of the testing facility. Uh, and so it looks as if NetVisa actually did a better job of locating the event 
uh, even though the detectors are four or 5,000 kilometers away from uh, the testing site, we got within less than a kilometer uh, of the actual site. And subsequently, we, we built a more sophisticated model, uh, which includes a model of the, the detailed form of the seismic uh, signals uh, that are produced by each event, uh, depending on the geological location in which they occur. And um, I'm not going to go through the details of this chart, but just down here, we see that in the low magnitude range, which is the area where uh, we are most worried about the detection capabilities of, of the seismic network, um, we're actually detecting 20 times as many events uh, as the combined human uh, machine system that the United Nations is running. Um, so we really reduce the detection threshold by, by more than a magnitude on the, on the Richter scale. Here's another uh, blog model, and um, this one is for natural language understanding. So it's a, it's a generative model of text, uh, but it's a little different from the typical generative model. A typical generative model basically says, well, word 12 is on the page because words 11, 10, 9, 8, and 7 were on the page, uh, which is not a very satisfactory explanation. You know, if you were a physicist and someone said, well, that's why text occurs is because previous text occurred. No text occurs on the page because there's something true in the world and someone is trying to say it. So let me see if we can express that in blog. So here we go. Uh, I'll write it uh, in English. Um, first of all, um, there are some things in the world, a lot of them, don't know how many. Uh, there are some relations in the world, quite a few, don't know how many. Um, and then the relations are expressed by some strings, don't know what they are. Um, and uh, some of the objects are related by some of relations. Don't know which ones, uh, and typically not very many. And then uh, people choose some fact, so some relation that holds among objects. They choose one of those things to say, uh, and then they say it. How do they say it? Well, they say it by making the arguments of a relation into the, the subject and object of the sentence and the string that describes a relation into the, the verbi bit of the sentence. Um, so that's the generative model. And this is completely unsupervised. So this is the, this is the Bayesian model. Um, we provide evidence in the form of sentences from the New York Times. There's a, uh, a special subset of named entity relationship descriptions uh, that Andrew McCallum's group uh, extracted from the New York Times. And then the query is, uh, what's true in the world? Okay, so this system knows nothing about the actual language. It doesn't know that it's English. Um, it knows nothing about the world. It does not know what relations exist or what objects exist. Uh, and then we just give it text and say what's true. And so um, it runs inference, and uh, here's the result. So here's an, one of the relations it discovers. Uh, it, it doesn't know what we call it, um, but it calls it relation number 46. And when you look at these, uh, these parse strings for the dependency between the two arguments, uh, you see that this relation is the relationship of corporate subsidiaryhood. And in the New York Times, it turns out there are 16 ways that you can describe one thing being a subsidiary of another, and it identifies those 16 and exactly those 16. Uh, and then you can ask it, well, what facts are true for relation 46? Uh, and you see a whole bunch of facts like this, uh, most of them apparently about advertising agencies, um, because they're all con collected into conglomerates. Um, and we had accuracy rates of over 95% for the relations that we looked at. Um, so this just shows the power of a little bit of prior knowledge uh, and Bayesian inference in a sufficiently expressive language and what you can do uh, with these kinds of techniques. So let me pause then briefly and look at where we are with uh, artificial intelligence. So Andrew Ng has a nice way of describing the current state of the art. Uh, it's not perfectly accurate, but as a rule of thumb, he says that if an ordinary person can do something in one second, uh, then we can probably make a machine learning system do it if we collect enough data. And I think that's uh, approximately right. Uh, we have fairly dexterous, uh, you know, folding towels requires a fair amount of dexterity, for example, but not perfect uh, dexterity. We have wonderfully agile robots. If you look at um, Boston Dynamics, uh, Big Dog uh, and Atlas robots, for example, uh, they're really incredibly impressive. Uh, and to a large extent, we would say that leg locomotion is pretty much a solved problem. Uh, when you look at the agility of the uh, quadcopters, um, for example, from Vijay Kumar's group, they're uh, unbelievably scary. 
Um, and so uh, we're in a good position with regard to the physical platforms uh, that we have, although I think the, the big open problem is still the, the truly dexterous hand uh, and manipulations using those hands. Um, and the perception is now to the point where it's certainly um, getting uh, across the threshold of enabling self-driving cars, for example. And that means that we will start to see applications where robots are operating successfully in unstructured environments, in homes, uh, in agriculture, uh, and so on. Uh, the other areas where we might see better performance as a result of uh, improved perception and also improved modeling uh, is the smart home, which has been uh, you know, just about to happen for the last 50 years or so. Uh, literally, I mean, there were, there were smart homes being designed and built 50 years ago. They just weren't very smart. The AI part was hopeless, and so it was an unbelievable nuisance to live in one of these houses. Uh, but that, I think, is going to be solved fairly soon. Um, we're not going to have real natural language understanding for a while, uh, but we'll have natural lang language understanding that's sufficient uh, to build web-scale question-answering systems. Uh, and we're already seeing, um, for example, Google is gradually shifting from uh, returning the results of keyword indexing to uh, actually returning the answer to your question. Uh, another application of shallow natural under language understanding will be the personal digital assistant. Um, uh, a lot of those uh, are available right now, but they're done by Wizard of Oz technique. There's actually a whole lot of humans on the other end of that system uh, and not AI, but uh, it's very clear what's going to happen uh, in that sector. Um, and other amazing tools will arise, I think, for, uh, for doing uh, country-scale micro-modeling of uh, economic processes uh, and all kinds of medical and scientific research. So there's still a lot missing, and I think Ramon was correct to say we, we are not close to having human-level AI. Uh, we don't have real understanding of language. Uh, we don't really understand how to integrate learning with knowledge. Um, and... Uh, one of my favorite areas is to figure out how it is that humans manage to make decisions on scales. So with respect to our primitive actions, our primitive steps, which are motor control actions, uh, coming to Ijkai is more than a billion steps. Now AlphaGo does successful decision making on the scale of 20 to 30, and that was considered an amazing achievement, right? But there's nothing that's gonna scale 20 to 30 up to billions of steps. Now clearly we don't do look ahead in detail. We don't plan out the billions of steps that we're gonna take. Um, but uh, we plan it out at some multiple levels of abstraction in, in a very complicated interlocking hierarchy of, of activities. Uh, and this is still something that that's in its infancy uh, in artificial intelligence, particularly the discovery of that hierarchy. How do, you, how do we build it in the first place? Um, and similar uh, remarks apply to our development of concepts and theories. So when you think about physics, how many layers of concepts are built up before you get to the Higgs boson? Uh, it's centuries of discovery and invention of those concepts, uh, and we don't know how to do or, uh, any of that really in AI. Now, um, it's not the case that just adding more CPUs and faster CPUs or quantum CPUs is going to solve these problems. Uh, and all that's going to do is get the wrong answer more quickly. Um, so it's going to require these conceptual breakthroughs, but it's hard to predict exactly when those conceptual breakthroughs are going to occur. And um, some of you may have seen this before in some other talks, but I want to re-emphasize the unpredictability uh, of these kinds of conceptual breakthroughs and the significance of, of the breakthrough when it does happen. So this is um, Ernest Rutherford, who was the, uh, the equivalent of the, the president of Ijkai, if you like. He was the, the distinguished senior figure of nuclear physics uh, in his time. Um, and he gave a number of speeches. This is just one of them on September 11th in 1933 in Leicester, uh, where he said, anyone who looks for a source of power in the transformation of the atoms is talking moonshine. Uh, and this was reported all over the world. Uh, and. Uh, he was absolutely adamant that all this talk of extracting the energy that they knew to be there uh, in the atom, they knew exactly how much energy there was because of relativity theory, um, and he was adamant that we would never get it out. Um, and this is Leo Zillard, and he read 
uh, a summary of this speech in the Times, and he went out for a walk, and crossed, as he was crossing the road, he figured out the answer, uh, which is to, to have a neutron-induced nuclear chain reaction, uh, which would create a the possibility of a nuclear explosion. Uh, and he also figured out how to have a damped uh, negative feedback system, which would en enable you to maintain it uh, just at the subcritical level uh, where you could have nuclear power. And he patented uh, both ideas fairly soon after that. Uh, so it went from never, completely impossible, uh, to pretty much solved, at least on the conceptual level, uh, within 16 hours. So I would say do not bet against human ingenuity uh, and do not bet the future of humanity on our inability to solve the problem of AI. So I'm going to state this as a premise, and you could say, uh, I'm not making this as a definite claim, but at least I would say uh, I don't believe the negation of this premise, which is that it's impossible that we will ever reach uh, AI, uh, human-level AI or superhuman AI. Uh, and I find it a bit distressing when I see uh, senior members of the AI community stating in print that we will never achieve human-level AI. Um, and uh, having the field has spent 60 years fending off the critics who said that, you know, you guys are too stupid, you have no idea what you're talking about, you're never going to have human-level AI, it's impossible. And we've spent 60 years fighting off that criticism, and now, uh, we, when it seems like it might be possible, uh, we're saying, oh, no, 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 it's never going to happen, so there's no possible risk of, of that, right? That, that seems like a defensive reaction that's not based uh, in real thought. So, if this is true, uh, if systems uh, will be able to use, for example, their ability to read everything that the human race has ever written, uh, they'll have a lot more information than any human being does. Uh, we've already seen in, in, in AlphaGo that they're better at doing look ahead, and if we solve the hierarchical long timescale uh, issues, then they'll be able to look further into the future with more accuracy than we can, um, and so they'll be able to out-decide us um, as humans. So this has some wonderful consequences. I don't want to say that better AI is necessarily bad. It, it's actually uh, extraordinarily good because everything we have uh, comes from our intelligence. So if we have access to more of it, uh, this cannot be anything but a step change in civilization. Uh, in our capability uh, to improve the overall quality of human life uh, to the greatest extent that's ever happened. So it's a very amazing opportunity. Now, people talk about the downsides, um, and some of them are actually quite immediate. Uh, here's one of them, um, this notion of using artificial intelligence to develop weapons that can choose to kill humans. Um, and in fact, there's, there's two downsides in this slide. I'm only going to mention the killer, the killer robot one. Uh, people, sorry. Um, People talk uh, a lot about the issue of employment. This is still very much subject to debate. I think gradually the, uh, the ec uh, economics community is coming around to the idea that, in fact, this is real. I was at a meeting uh, where there were several Nobel Prize winning economists, and they all said that this is the biggest problem facing the world economy. But this is what I want to talk about. AI. Uh, possibly being the end of the human race, and what, what could that mean, right? And um, there is a lot of noise about this in the press, and, and some of it uh, may look uh, as if it's scaremongering, but I think you have to remember that what the press does uh, is take anything you say, uh, multiply it by a thousand, uh, take out the bits you actually said, uh, and then report the results. Um, and so uh, you have to you have to uh, filter what you read in the media to understand, probably, you know, to guess what was actually said. Um, so if you remember, for example, there was a report uh, a couple of years ago that was written by several people in the community called um, Research Agenda for Robust and Beneficial AI, which was the most boring document that we could write. Uh, it did not have the word risk. It did not have the word extinction, existential, none of that stuff. It just said the only mention of, of anything down any kind of downside was that um, uh, it was important to understand both uh, the benefits and the potential pitfalls of progress in artificial intelligence. 
Uh, and still, journalists published articles with Terminator robots all over them uh, and said that Elon Musk was predicting the end of the world and so on and so forth. So, um, uh, and this is one of the reactions among many from the AI community, right? Well, the people who are talking about this, they don't know anything about AI, right? They're not even real scientists. Uh, well, some of them are real scientists. Um, uh, and here's one example. Uh, if we could keep the machines in a subservient position, for instance, by turning off the power at strategic moments, we should, as a species, feel greatly humbled. So, uh, who said this? Was it, uh, was it one of these media pontificators? No, this was Alan Turing, 1951. Um, and this is one of the sources of unease that people might have, right? You make something that's more intelligent than you are, what do you think's gonna happen? Um, so that unease, we could call it the gorilla problem because the gorillas did it, or at least their ancestors did it a few million years ago. They produced the human species, which is a lot more intelligent than the gorillas. And they're having a meeting here to discuss whether it was a good idea. Um, and you can kind of tell from their general sort of demeanor and, and body language that they're really pretty unhappy about, about that decision. Uh, it was this terrible idea to, to produce the human species because now they're in a lot of trouble. Um, but if that's the only source of unease, there's really not much we can do about it except stop, right? And then we don't get any of the benefits. So we have to understand, uh, just as with other powerful technologies like the nuclear technology, clearly uh, nuclear weapons uh, were a potential downside of, nu uh, uh, of nuclear technology. Um, so the fact that uranium sufficiently uh, enriched uh, and a large enough mass of uranium explodes uh, is a downside of nuclear physics. Uh, so how do you prevent the explosion, right? Reasonable question. But to do that, you have to understand why it explodes and, and, and then figure out how to prevent it. So why is better AI a problem? Right? What is the nature of the process by which something bad could happen? Um, and this is another quote. We'd better be quite sure that the purpose put into the machine is the purpose which we really desire. And this is the core of the issue. And this was pointed out by Norbert Wiener in 1960, the, the founder of cybernetics, um, brilliant mathematician, uh, and he actually wrote this having just seen Arthur Samuel's checker playing program, uh, learn to play checkers much better than Arthur Samuel could play. Um, and he sort of extrapolated from there, um, and he was very explicit that this is not an immediate thing, this is something on a very large time scale, but what we do now is going to have consequences on that very large time scale. Uh, that makes it very difficult to know what is the right choice, but because of the scale of the consequences, we have to think extremely hard about it. Now, you could also attribute this quote to, uh, to King Midas, um, because he had the same problem. He put a purpose into the machine, I want everything I touch to turn to gold, he got exactly what he asked for, and then his food and drink and relatives turned to gold, and he died in misery and starvation. Um, and this is, uh, ubiquitous in, in human mythology. There's the genie, you ask for three wishes. The third wish is always, please undo the first two wishes, because I made a mess of it, right? We are terrible at specifying what it is we really want, and that's the nature of the problem. That if we don't get it right the first time, and you put it into a super intelligent machine, uh, then uh, you're gonna face uh, a competition between you and the machine, because now, you don't have the same objective, you have different objectives. <clears throat> and so it's a, a non-cooperative game. Uh, now, more recently, uh, Steve Omohundro wrote a paper talking uh, about what's called instrumental goals. And these are the goals that follow uh, as a consequence of any uh, original prime objective. Um, so, for example, even if the objective is simple, something as simple as fetching the coffee, uh, a sufficiently intelligent machine realizes that if, if someone switches it off, it won't be able to fetch the coffee. And therefore, because it has the objective of fetching the coffee, it necessarily has the objective of preserving its own existence. So we don't build in self-preservation. Asimov's third law, that the robot's supposed to preserve itself, is completely unnecessary because it's a logical consequence of any other objective. There are very few things you can do better when you're dead uh, than when you're alive, except for putrefying. 
So, um, so this is the takeaway message. Just remember this one thing, you can't fetch the coffee if you're dead. Okay. Um, now, if you combine this notion that a system is going to preserve itself against any attempt to interfere with its pursuit of the goal, uh, it will also try to acquire uh, computational, physical, financial resources to improve the probability of success, to, to ward off any possibility of failure, um, and you combine that with misalignment in the objectives, um, then you get not the Terminator robot, which is the sort of spontaneous malevolent consciousness problem, uh, but you get the, the 2001 space oddities. You get HAL, <clears throat> because HAL has that objective which is not aligned with those of the two humans uh, on the spaceship, um, and he ends up uh, in conflict with the humans on foot. Or, I guess, fortunately for the humans, HAL is not super intelligent. Eventually, Dave does outwit HAL uh, and manage to turn him off. But had HAL really been super intelligent, uh, that would not have happened. So, I'm not sure what happened to this slide. Uh, anyway, so it says reasons not to pay attention. Um, and um, there are a lot of them. And I think the AI community is coming up with one after another uh, reason to ignore this issue because it's a difficult issue. It makes you worried. It makes you feel under attack. It makes you feel like you might be a bad person uh, if you're contributing to the extinction of the human race. Uh, I think that's the wrong uh, response. Denial is not, not going to solve the problem. Um, so one of those responses, as I mentioned, is it will never happen. Right? And I'll just refer you back to Rutherford and, uh, and Zillard in 1933. Um, there's a response, well, it, it, it might eventually happen, but it's too soon to worry about it. Well, what's too soon? Right? If, if, uh, if I said that you know, a giant asteroid is going to hit the Earth uh, in, 40, I guess that's 49 years' time, would you say, okay, well, that's too soon to worry about it? Too soon. I'm going to just you know, come back in, in 2064 and we'll have another conversation. No, that's not what would happen. We would immediately put the entire scientific and engineering community of the planet Earth into action to try to figure out how to deflect or destroy this asteroid before it hits the Earth. Because we don't know how long it's going to take to solve the problem. And we don't know how long it's going to take to solve the problem of controlling intelligent systems that are more capable than ourselves. So there's a lot more reasons um, which I won't go through, you can, you can read them as they go by. Um, I do want to point to um, uh, one of these, yeah, you can't control research, that's another uh, response. Well, you know, yes, you're right, it, it is going to destroy the human race, but there's nothing we can do about it. It's just going to happen because we're going to continue doing research. Well, that isn't true. We've controlled the genetic en engineering of humans for more than 40 years, um, and uh, that, that might be breaking down right now, but clearly there is evidence uh, that when we put our minds to it as a community, we can decide what to do and what not to do. I'm not necessarily recommending that we stop doing AI research. Uh, what I'm recommending is that we work on solving the problem. Um, I'm not going to talk about, uh, yeah, we won the Luddite of the Year Award. Um, but that's kind of odd because the Luddites include Turing, Minsky, uh, Norbert Wiener, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, so some, some of the major technological figures of the 20th century, it's hard to describe these people as Luddites, but um, don't worry, we can just switch it off, right? This is something that I've heard very uh, senior and successful, intelligent, brilliant AI people saying as a reason not to even think about this problem. Well, of course, uh, it's probably likely that a super intelligent system would think of that. Um, and uh, here's another one. Yeah, don't mention the risks. It's bad for funding. Uh, <laughs> I'm not kidding. This is, <clears throat> this is, again, in writing from very senior figures in the artificial intelligence field. Um, and I would just point to the history of nuclear power, where the nuclear industry did not mention the risks. And anyone who talked about the risk was, was treated as you know, some kind of pinko commie who, who needed to be silenced. Um, and then Three Mile Island happened, and then Chernobyl happened, uh, and the nuclear industry was destroyed by its own insistence that there were no risks. So this is not a profitable strategy, uh, nor is it an honorable one. Okay, so let's assume that I've convinced you. Now you're asking, I hope, uh, what do we do? 
Okay, what do we do? Um, so, I'll just I, all I can do is tell you what I think I'm, I'm going to try to do. Um, we set up a center for human compatible AI, and the goal is to figure out how do we make AI systems that are provably beneficial, right? That, that cannot act in ways where we are post hoc unhappy with what they did, uh, or, you know, or we might be dead, in which case we're very unhappy with what they did. Um, and there are actually a lot of other groups now working on this problem. There's uh, the Future of Humanity Institute, there's the uh, CESAR in Cambridge, which uh, also has a new center called the Center for the Future of Intelligence, funded by the Leverhulme Trust. Uh, there's MIRI, uh, Machine Intelligence Research Institute, the Future of Life Institute, OpenAI. Uh, the Partnership on AI uh, has among its uh, goals to solve these problems. Uh, and funding agencies and professional societies are, are uh, getting um, getting the idea and w uh, trying to help solve this problem. So provably beneficial AI, is, it's almost a, an oxymoron because provably makes you think about theorems, beneficial makes you think about touchy-feely, wishy-washy, goody-woody kinds of things, and it's hard to put those two things together. Um, so what I mean by that is, is the following, right? Um, we're not gonna be able to prove beneficial you know, an AGI that lands from outer space, right? Uh, and a lot of the literature in the AGI community, I think, sort of views the AGI as just some black box that landed from outer space and is arbitrarily intelligent and has arbitrary objectives. Well, if that's the problem, we can't solve it. We are toast. But that isn't the problem. Uh, we have to figure out how to design things uh, to avoid these problems in the first place. So we're going to have to have a formal framework, a formal definition of what is the problem that we want to build this, the system to solve. Uh, let's call that the F framework. And we're going to build F solvers. And um, we have to operate under the assumption that this F solver can be arbitrarily capable, that the components out of which it's constructed can be arbitrarily good at the job that those components have in the architecture. Um, but if we design the, the training regimen, i.e. the sort of the, the, the objective function for learning um, and the way the subsystems are connected and so on, if we do it in the right way, we want to be able to prove that um, the human is going to be better off with the system that we're designing. So there are three simple ideas on how to do this. One is that the robot's only objective is to maximize the realization of human values. So this is its only objective. Um, and I'll say what, in a second what I mean by human values. It's probably not what you think. Um, the second point is that the robot has to be uncertain about what the values are. This is crucial. The robot should never believe that it knows for sure what the objective is, um, unless it is in fact correct about what the objective is. And then the third thing is the robot has to learn something about the objective, and it does that by uh, ob primarily by observing human behavior. The, the human choice behavior provides, uh, in some sense, ground truth, and it's a complicated sense, uh, ground truth about the underlying human objectives. So let me rephrase that to get rid of this, this uh, possibly problematic notion of human values. Uh, we'll talk about puffles instead. So puffles are preferences over future lives. So this is what I really mean. I don't mean that the machine is trying to somehow uh, develop by observing humanity an ideal ethical theory. Uh, that's not what this is about. This is just about the ability for a machine to predict what each person would prefer their life to be like, and then to try and help them get that. So why is uncertainty in the objective important? Uh, it's important um, because it's a form of humility, and that humility is what allows the machine to be controlled by us humans uh, and to be safe. And you might ask, well, okay, we've had uncertainty in AI since, uh, you know, late 70s. We've really focused centrally on uncertainty, uh, on certain sensory information, on certain transition models in Markov decision processes, and so on. But we've always assumed that the objective is known for sure perfectly. Um, and why is that? Well, if you actually look at the definition of MDP, if you add uncertainty to the reward function, um, it doesn't matter because you get exactly the same optimal policy whether you have a distribution over objectives or you replace that distribution 
by its expectation because everything is linear and it just works out that way. So in an MDP, in a POMDP, uncertainty in objectives has no effect on the optimal policy unless the environment can provide additional information about the objective. So the irrelevance of uncertainty only holds in environments that cannot provide information about the objective. But as I just said, anything that a human does in the world provides information about that, that human's objectives. And so uh, the standard formulation of MDPs and POMDPs is actually inadequate to handle this issue. So observable human actions are one source. We could also just have uh, you know, a, human, a special kind of action is to just give a reward signal, uh, as happens in reinforcement learning. So the general theory of how AI is going to work has to include both the human and the machine as agents. Um, so thinking of the agent itself, decision, making decisions with respect to its own objectives, uh, is a special case that's actually extremely restrictive. Uh, and um, I think there was probably a mistake uh, that this is the way we've thought about AI um, for quite a while. And inevitably then, the human is going to have special status in this theory, and in, if you sort of look at it, of course it's going to have special status, because we're not doing AI for the benefit of bacteria, right? Uh, we're doing AI for our benefit, uh, and so we're, we're bound to have uh, just as in economics, there's a, a theory called principal agent theory. Uh, the principal is supposed to be benefiting from the work of the agent, uh, and that's what AI is supposed to be about. We're building these intelligent systems to help us. So here's a, a graphical model way of thinking about it, right? Here's, uh, here's the classical idea, right? That uh, there's a human objective which is observed, right? And it affects human behavior, but it's also given to the machine and defines uh, the machine behavior. Uh, and so that, the fact that that variable is observed then decouples the machine behavior from the human behavior. In fact, once the machine has the objective, it doesn't care what the human does, right? It's completely irrelevant. But in fact, uh, it's, this is not really uh, the case because really the human objective is not directly observed. We don't know the full preference over future lives that human beings have. And so when the human objective is not observed, then the human and machine behaviors remain coupled. Uh, this, is, you know, this is a notional graphical model. I'm not trying to be too mathematical here. But this is an inevitable consequence uh, that this becomes a multi-agent problem. So let me give a few simple examples. One, image classification. We're all aware of the Google's PR disaster when their image classifier classified some people uh, as gorillas. Well, how did that happen? Um, I'm betting, I haven't actually you know, asked them what happened, but I'm betting that they were using a standard machine learning algorithm that minimizes the squared loss, uh, and the loss comes from the loss matrix, which tells you the cost of misclassification, and they didn't even bother to write the loss matrix, right? They just assumed it was uniform. Uh, and that was an incorrect description of their true value function. So how should it have gone? The machine learning system should have not a loss matrix, but a distribution over loss matrices, which is a, a much more complicated, high-dimensional uh, thing. Um, and it should refuse to classify some of the examples because it's not sure that might be too risky um, until it knows more about the, the details of the loss matrix. It should say, I don't know what this is, or I'm not going to say what it is, or what I think it is, because uh, it's too risky. And maybe ask the human to help out and say, you know, is, it, is this a bad idea to classify one of these as potentially one of those? Um, and so you get a much more uh, complex and rich interaction between the learning algorithm uh, and, the, and, and the owner of the learning algorithm uh, to make sure that you don't have those kinds of disasters. Another example is just going back to this fetching the coffee. So when you fetch the coffee, um, uh, the, traditionally we view that as just a goal for a planning system, right? Uh, and in utility theoretic terms, that would mean that any state where you have the coffee, you know, has value one, and any state where you don't have the coffee has value zero. I'm, I'm simplifying, but um, we viewed it as a, a specification for what successful behavior means. That's completely untrue, right? If I said to the robot, fetch the coffee, and I was in a really expensive hotel in Paris, and it came back, you know, and I charged 31 euros to my credit, credit card to buy a cup of coffee, I would have said, you idiot, you know, why, why did you pay 31 euros for a cup of coffee? Uh, well, you know, you could have gone somewhere else or, or just come back and said it's too expensive. 
um, uh, you know, you certainly wouldn't want the, the system to, you know, kill all the other people in Starbucks so that it could get the coffee more quickly. Um, and so on. So there's a lot of stuff involved, and you might say, well, if the robot doesn't know all these things, how is it going to be any use whatsoever until it's sort of learned all the things you care about, and it's just going to be paralyzed? Well, actually, it's not quite true, because as long as it leaves the rest of those things, if it doesn't know whether they, you really care about them or really don't care about them, if it doesn't know the value of all the other attributes of the environment, as long as it doesn't mess with them, um, then the instruction fetch the coffee says, you know, I would be better off if I had coffee than not, all other things being equal. So leave all the other things being equal, uh, and you can still be useful to the human, uh, even though you have a de great degree of uncertainty about their overall uh, preference structure. Um, so um, let me briefly talk, I'm, I think I'm going to run over a little bit. Uh, let me briefly talk about value alignment. So how do we get the, the values actually aligned? How do we learn more about uh, values by observing human actions? So there's a subfield uh, of AI called inverse reinforcement learning, uh, which is the inverse of reinforcement learning. Instead of uh, learning behavior from rewards, we learn rewards from observing behavior. Um, and this, this seems to work quite well because you know, if you think about it the other way around, when I want to get behavior out of a machine, the reward function is usually the most concise way to describe what I want. So I can get great Go playing behavior out of a machine just by telling it what it means to win and lose at Go. That's the only thing that we tell AlphaGo uh, along with the rules. We just tell it what it means to win and lose, and it figures out how to behave um, from that information. So it's a succinct explanation for arbitrarily complex behaviors. Now, um, we actually want something more sophisticated than that because, as I said, the human has to be involved. The human's behavior is coupled in, um, and we really need a two-player game, or in general, and, you know, it'll be N humans and M robots, but just think about one human and one robot. So the human uh, acts according to their own internal preference structure, and, uh, but may not be able to explicate it exactly. The robot has to optimize with respect to that preference structure, but doesn't know what it is. So that's the game. Uh, and when you solve that game, you find the Nash equilibria have exactly the properties that you hope, that the robot will ask questions before it does anything rash. The human will try to teach the robot uh, by demonstration what, what, it like, what the human does and doesn't like. Um, so let me illustrate one very simple um, instantiation of this called the off-switch problem. So in the off-switch problem, the robot um, has the objective like fetch the coffee, and as Omohandro pointed out, it has an incentive immediately to then disable its off switch so that uh, nothing can prevent it from getting the coffee. Um, and we don't want that to happen. Right? That seems like an extremely unsafe development uh, if that's how machines are going to behave. So how do we stop it? Right? I mean, it seems like it's just a logical consequence of the objective that we gave it. Um, but somehow we have to stop it. And it's no good saying, well, just give it a rule saying it's not allowed to disable the off switch, because it has an incentive to disable the off switch. So just as we find ways around tax laws, it will find ways around uh, any, t any attempt to, to prevent it from disabling the off switch. So the answer is, once you have uncertainty about the objective, once the machine knows that it doesn't know the full objective, then uh, it has an incentive uh, because the human will only switch the robot off if the robot's doing something or is about to do something that human doesn't like. The robot doesn't know what that is, but it knows that it doesn't want to do things the human doesn't like. Uh, that's, that's rule number one. Um, and so it should actually be quite happy to be switched off if it's uncertain about the objective. And you can prove this mathematically, um, that there's, there's a positive incentive to allow yourself to be switched off and that incentive is, in some sense, monotonically related to the amount of uncertainty you have about the objective. Um, and when you design the robot that way, you can show that it's provably beneficial to the human. Um, why is this off PowerPoint? It stopped working. Hmm. I don't know what to do about that. <laughs> okay. Okay, I may have to zoom through this a bit. 
Okay, um, so if you want more details, um, those are the, the, the two papers that are in the proceedings, uh, on one this afternoon and one on Thursday. Uh, so please go, my students will be presenting those papers. Um, so here's just a little preview of, of uh, how it's set up. So it's an incredibly simple uh, model just to illustrate this concept. So the robot gets to go first in this game, um, and it can choose to either do some action uh, immediately, so sort of bypassing the off switch, um, and that action has some value UA, which is unknown. So there's uh, a distribution over the values because it doesn't know how much the human will like this action. Or the robot can just switch itself off, so it can just commit suicide because it believes it's not good enough uh, to act, right? But a third choice is to say, okay, let me give the human an opportunity to switch me off. So we tell the human, okay, I'd like to do A, but I'm gonna wait and you can switch me off, okay? Then the human can choose to switch the robot off, in which case it gets value zero, um, or it can say, well, I'm not gonna switch you off, I'm gonna allow you to do action A. So then the robot will do action A. And what does the robot believe at that point about the value of the action? Well, it knows that it must be bigger than zero, otherwise the human would have switched me off. And so it has a posterior distribution that looks like that, right? The, the negative part of distribution has now been conditioned out. Uh, and you can show very simply that in this case, uh, waiting and allowing the human to switch you off is always preferred to either switching yourself off or bypassing the off switch and just doing the action. And this is a completely straightforward theorem. It's exactly like a non-negative value of information theorem. Uh, in fact, that's what it is because the human's decision is providing information to the robot uh, about what the utility function is. Um, so, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over uh, how we solve the wireheading problem, um, but we can talk about that afterwards. Uh, and just let me wrap up by saying um, I am reasonably optimistic that this research agenda uh, is um, going to be fruitful, and we've already, uh, I think, made a little bit of progress along the line towards provably beneficial AI. So one reason for optimism is that uh, sufficiently intelligent AI systems, particularly ones that can read, will have access to arbitrarily large amounts of data about human behavior because everything we've ever written describes people doing things and then other people being upset about it. So that's good, right? So we can, we can go look at everything the human race has written and, and learn a lot from that. Um, another reason for optimism is that there's actually a very strong economic incentive to solve this problem long before we get to super intelligent AI. Um, so let me just give you one example, right? So here, here's the ro domestic robot um, and domestic robot's home and you're late from work and the kids are hungry and there's nothing in the fridge. Uh, and then the robot sees the cat. And something happens. The robot, of course, doesn't know the nutritional value of the cat uh, is not as high as the sentimental value of the cat. And so, uh, so the cat gets cooked for dinner. Right, so this one incident would be the end of the domestic robot industry, right? Because it lacks, it lacks a certain form of common sense. We've thought up to now of common sense knowledge as being about you know, what happens when you spill the milk or um, you know, putting blocks on top of each other and things like that. But a lot of human common sense is about what people want and don't want. Uh, and really, we don't really distinguish between these kinds of knowledge. Our, our mathematical theories do. One is transition model and one is value function. Uh, but humans are expected to learn the value function properly. And if they don't, they're considered psychopaths. Um, and you know, no one wants to have a psychopathic domestic robot. So that would be a strong incentive to get it right. Um, there are some difficulties, right? I'm not, I'm not saying this is straightforward. I think it's you know, decades of research to really get it right. That's one reason to, to start work on it now. Uh, and, um, and it's really us, right? Because to understand what we want, even assuming that there is some way of describing us as wanting uh, something, having any kind of stable 
uh, meaningful preference over human lives. So assuming that we do, we have to invert our behavior to get at it. And our behavior is produced by our cognitive system, which is incredibly complicated, computationally limited, uh, and um, very, very inconsistent. So we have to invert through this whole complexity of human psychology, uh, which of course seems to be a difficult problem. So there's a, there, there are some drawbacks. But um, let me just point out, for example, computationally limited. You know, when Lisa Dahl played, there was probably one move where he changed the game theoretic value of his game from you know, maybe drawn or won to lost. So he made a losing move. Uh, now, if the system observes that losing move, it shouldn't say, oh, Lisa Dahl wanted to lose the game, right? He was actually trying to win, but his computational limitations prevented him from making winning moves. So we have to understand human computational limitations, uh, or com you know, as well as computational limitations of machines, in order to understand human behavior. Uh, we have to understand uh, how our behavior is generated, and it's generated actually from an extremely complicated, multi-layered hierarchy of interlocking subroutines of behavior. You know, I'm I'm in the giving a talk at Ijkai subroutine. Uh, and there are many things I can't do in this subroutine. I can't sort of pick a baseball out of my pocket and throw it at the audience. Uh, I can't, you know, buy, you know, take out my phone and start buying AT&T stock. It's just not part of this subroutine. Um, so we have to understand the subroutine structure of human behavior in order to understand what someone is doing. Um, and a lot of us are nasty. Now, I want to point out, just because we're nasty does not mean the robot is going to act like us. Right? This is just not the case. We are nasty often because we are selfish and we don't care that much about the well-being of others and we have our own objectives to pursue. But the robot is purely altruistic. It doesn't have any objectives except those of the people it's trying to help. Um, and uh, it doesn't have to act in a nasty way in order to do that. So it's just learning to predict what people want uh, and it is not learning to want those things. Um, there is one caveat to this, that if people uh, actually <clears throat> have a negative sign on the well-being of others, we don't want the robot to take that into account uh, in how it trades off the well-being of, uh, of those two people. Right? So I think we have to sort of filter out uh, uh, one aspect of people's value functions, which is uh, the pleasure they derive from the unhappiness of other people. Uh, and I don't see a way around that. If someone can figure out a different solution, I'd be very happy. So just to summarize, um, I think that uh, if we follow uh, the, the path that we have been on, uh, which is building intelligent systems into which we put objectives, uh, then we do face this risk from misalignment, uh, and that's a serious problem. Um, but if we change the way we think about AI from this unary notion that there's an intelligent system with with objectives that it somehow has uh, and is pursuing um, to a notion where the only objectives reside in us uh, and the machine is simply there to try to help us uh, with those objectives, um, that's actually a better way of thinking about what AI should be. And it solves this problem of misalignment uh, and seems to give us some, uh, some degree of safety. Uh, and if you're worried about the old form of AI, don't worry, it is just a special case uh, where uh, the uncertainty is reduced to zero and, and the machine is absolutely positive, it knows what the objective is. Um, but it seems to me that uh, in doing this work, uh, the actual nature of humans is going to be inextricably intertwined with, uh, with our field. And that's a change. Um, and it, it uh, makes me nervous because actual humans are extremely complicated. Um, but I think we have to do this. I think we have to uh, uh, also, not think about this as a separate field of AI safety. Um, and draw the analogy to civil engineering. When a civil engineer says, I build bridges, he doesn't need to add, oh, but I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm a safety bridge designer, and I design bridges that don't fall down, uh, right? It's, it's, it's built into the meaning of the word bridge that it's not supposed to fall down. Uh, and it should be built into the meaning of the word AI uh, that is beneficial to us. Uh, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't approach this as there's AI researchers and then there's the safety people nagging uh, and the ethics people nagging the AI researchers. It should be just intrinsic to what we do as a field. Uh, and I think in the process of making our preferences over future lives uh, and our value structures more explicit, 
uh, we may actually become better ourselves. Thank you. And sorry for running over. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. For the sake of time, I think we will skip the session, uh, the questions. I mean, you can uh, meet Stuart during the week and talk to him. So now we are going to break for coffee. Uh, there will be coffee served outside, but also on the second level. So some of you can go uh, to the second level for coffee. Make sure you are uh, at the session at 10.30 sharp, okay?